Hello there, sword friends. This is going to be a quick video about this Project Tonto that I got. Now, this wasn't actually a project I did, but it is a custom Tonto, and so there's some things I really, really like about it, some things I don't, and I better talk about it now because it's leaving my collection soon. Uh, anyway, the things to note, this is a Rick Barrett uh, Tonto. I believe it's made out of 1075 steel, and it's... We'll get to the blade and geometry and profile and whatnot, but just looking at the outside of it, the blade was made by Rick. There are antique... Uh, Manuki on here, these these little badges on the on the handle, uh, and then it was mounted by somebody else. Now the style of mount is called Hamandachi or Hamandachi. I'm I'm miserable at pronunciation. Nevertheless, I was under the impression initially that it was Aikuchi, but I guess the suba is called a Hamandachi, so it's a Hamandachi style mount. I could be wrong on that or interpreting wrong, but nevertheless, that is the style of mount. So if you're looking for ideas for a project yourself. That would be the, the Google terminology, and I'll try and put the way you spell that in the description down below. The things that I guess I really note about it is that the look, you see this kind of horn fittings here, horn fuchi kashra, and then the normal horn parts that you would see on the side, the kweguchi, kojuri, karikata over here. Um, and all in all, it kind of blends with the eyes, but it's very blingy. This is, this is a bedazzled with some egawa everywhere. In that you see it on the the handle here there's no ito it's just pure samegawa or well it's pure in the sense that it's just a samegawa wrap um, you can note the seam kind of along the the base here and then the the saya is made with a patchwork of samegawa now uh, i was under the impression that wrapping um a saya in, in samegawa is cumbersome and, and difficult, but I thought maybe patchwork would be easy, but I'm told by the folks that do it that it is it is quite the contrast. These little patches of Samegawa, these uh, panels of Samegawa that are wrapped around here, all kind of have to be fit and lined up together and cut to match, and it's kind of in this spiral pattern as well. Um, and then they all have to be sanded and lacquered so that they're they're even along you know, the, the flat of the blade, you can see that it doesn't dip or dip it down at all. It, it's very smooth and clean all along the surface. And as the Samego is, is kind of naturally uneven, you can see, you know, here's here's a larger node, and you can see that it's it's bumpy and it's a, you know, it's a natural material. It's not perfectly flat. So that requires a little bit of craftsmanship and finesse to, to deal with. Uh, this one in particular has been kind of lacquered with black, has blots of little blotches of red or, or some red in the background, and then it's sanded flat. And it just makes this kind of really cool looking uh, surface on the blade that changes, you know, texturally it feels the same all around, but it just looks like it has so many little differences and changes in texture, even though it's a bit of an illusion because it's all, it's all flat. Anyway, I think it creates a very cool looking feel and uh or rather a really cool look feel wise um it feels it feels like lacquered samegawa you can make out a very small amount of texture but not not a lot the handle is just samegawa and th this is something that i found personally i don't really like the feel of now it's grippy um so if you if you hold on to it but it kind of bites into your hands a little bit even with smaller nodule samegawa like this uh it really kind of bites into your hand and is un uncomfortable, especially if you're using this for a long time. Uh, I don't really like the way the way it feels. Now, if you had a glove on or something like that, maybe it would assist in, in getting purchase in the glove. But uh, me personally, with my bare hands, I don't find it very comfortable to grip. This one isn't that bad, but in general, I find I don't like kind of this natural, raw, samegawa feel. Um, it doesn't uh, doesn't feel super comfortable in my hands. If you've never felt it, it's I don't know, it's it's not super prickly if you touch it, but as soon as you grip it and really try to kind of hammer fist the grip, um, it uh, it kind of bites in a little bit, especially if you're actually hitting stuff with a with just a semi-gawa. Those little nodules kind of dig into you a little bit, and it's not super fun. Overall, you can also see that the badges are, are stuck on here. I found that they don't, it's not something easy to, to come off at all. So I'm not exactly sure what's used to, to get these in here, what kind of glue, adhesive, pin, uh, is used to stick them on, but they, they stay on pretty good. There's no movement or anything like that. Not that you would expect that to be the case, but anyway, um, I almost wonder if the the little badges, the Manuki, uh, detract from the overall appearance more than anything else. I, I think I might like it more with just Samegawa, or maybe not something like an axe and whatever 
whatever it is. Anyway, let's move on to the blade. The light now is really going to help bring out my forehead in just the way I want it to. The blade. Anyway, so the blade is a, a different type of Tonto that you might not have seen before. It has, it has a generally different shape to it, and that the curvature of the blade goes forward. Now, I had to break out the good old connoisseur's book of Japanese swords, and uh, it's, it's called Uchi Sori, and that is a, a forward curvature, and the book notes that this is a shape that took place um, more commonly in the Kamakura period, which, if you're not a student of Japanese history and don't know the timelines, that's, that's a long time ago. I have to look it up. I don't know what the Kamakura period was. I know it's a long time ago. 1200? Know this before I do it. Well, shit, I was kind of right. So the Kamakura period, I guess, is actually between 1185 and 1333 is what a quick Google search registers for me. Anyway, it puts some historical context in the shape. The blade is this very wide, stout uh, blade. It's difficult for me to really put into perspective how big this blade is. Actually, as I say that out loud, it's not very difficult for me to put into perspective how wide the blade is. Let me get another blade. So well, this is not exactly a Tonto. This is the top of the Sino Sword... Uh, or Jayco Sword San Mai Katana that I broke some time ago in a review. And you can just note the difference in thickness between this katana. Um, granted, this is near the, the top. This is <laughs> the Mono Uchi, uh, or a good part of it, of the blade. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, you can spot there's a pretty substantial difference just as I hold them next to each other. This is a very stout, hefty blade, and it feels like it, it'd really be able to drive into armor. Um, and it has a very just very stout presence in my hand. Now the things that I'll note about it, it's got a uh, copper looking hamandachi or it's a small suba, I suppose that's what it's that's what it's supposedly called, this sepa suba looking thing. Uh, it's got a habaki that was made on it out of copper with some kind of adornments to it. Uh, the blade is made by Rick Barrett. If you're not familiar with his work, I've kind of talked about it uh, quite a few times on, on the old channel here. But you can see, I mean, it just it just has a really absolutely gorgeous hamon. And he is, uh, Rick is, is quite a craftsman. He is very, very good at what he does, and what he does is make swords. And obviously Tontos. Now, I haven't had many Tonto from Rick. Um, this is, is, I think, maybe the first Tonto that I've had from Rick. I'm not, uh, it's a first world problem when you've had so many custom swords you can't remember them all. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that this is, this is the only Tonto I've had. Let me see if I can adjust this light to get a marginally better view of the old Kisaki here. He does such a good job with these hamons. They come out so bold. Uh, it's, you know, granted I have to futz around with the light here in my so that it really pops in the camera. But in general, this is a very easy piece to, to examine and appreciate. I can hold it up and, and really see the, the hamon quite well in just about any light. And it certainly gives me a sense or appreciation for just a stout, meaty tanto. I mean, this is this would be effectively a comfortable wakazashi almost. It is, it is very meaty in the hand. Now, as I mentioned before, this is gonna move on. I'm not gonna have this tanto much longer. Um, it's, it's been sold, it's moving off to the next home, but while I had it, I really enjoyed it, and it's, it's definitely an interesting shape. I would not have, have thought that, uh, well, I've never had any experience with the shape in Japanese Tontos, and I have to admit, I kind of like it. Uh, from the standpoint of having a Tonto as a sidearm in close quarters, uh, I mean, I feel like I can move it around pretty easily. It has the heft to really move through stuff. If I was working with somebody that had um, some sort of leather armor or any kind of armor, uh, this this thing not only kind of gives me a club in my hand to, to work with, but I feel like it's it's got the mass to really drive into things. I feel like I could really move this around. It's so stout and so thick that I really wouldn't mind, uh, you know, really putting my whole body weight into it, and I wouldn't have to worry about the blade flexing, bending, or, or you know, really doing anything but driving forward. It's like one giant nail. Yeah, I thought it would be fun to share. The tanto shape is different, and it seems like Japanese swords and arms uh, oftentimes get a lot of grief for having very little variation, at least, you know, not necessarily among the people that appreciate Japanese swords already, but there's a lot of folks that, as they look at 
various types of swords that interest them, having a broad range of interests in swords. They see Japanese swords and see that there's very little variation as it relates to the changes in shape and such over time, as were the counterparts in Europe, for example, had a lot of variations, different changes in sizes and shapes and materials, and Japanese swords had less of that variation. But this, I think, is one uh, kind of case in point that shows that the the blade changed in both in terms of profile, thickness, uh, quite a bit over time. And it's it's interesting to see these types of examples. It almost reminds me a little bit of, like, Porsche, right? I mean, as I look at uh, a Porsche from 60 years ago versus a Porsche today, uh, I, I can see, you know, I think, what is it? The philosophy is they think they got it right the first time and they've just been evolving rather than uh, completely redesigning. Uh, and that seems to be the, the thought process a little bit around the Japanese style sword is that it evolves and changes, uh, but it's it's not exactly that it lacks variation. Over time, there's a lot of changes in in shape and size, and uh, there's different methods to assembly. There's a lot to appreciate in there. Now, that's not me saying they're the best or the coolest or the most toppy, choppy a tank and half type thing. But I do have an appreciation for the, the variation and the different types of shapes and why they were used uh, throughout, throughout you know, the Japanese sword realm. I, I see a lot of variation in that subject. Um, again, you know, maybe the angles don't change as much as they do in some other types of blades, but to say that they stayed the same and don't have any variation is, is, uh, is not correct. You don't, uh, it might be a little more subtle, but it's certainly there. The other thing I thought that would be worth noting, other than the, you know, perhaps unusual shape for a Tonto, is if you were thinking about a project, um, quite often I think this, this is the only patchwork Samegawa Saya that I've seen. Now I've seen other Saya's coated in Samegawa, but I haven't seen in person really anything quite like this. Um, this is a very, very impe impressive type of thing to, to do, and I, I, you know, I think personally my choice might not be to put red in it or to to change how this Saya would work with something else, uh, but but it is it is a really remarkable thing, and I think I think it looks it has a it has an effect that's unique and different and kind of stands out a, a bit. And so I thought it was worth worth showing some of the the bedazzlements of the of the Saya here. All right, well I have rambled on long enough. That's all I have for you. I hope it's been mildly entertaining and interesting. If you have any interest in Tantos, uh, I don't know if Rick would still make them. He stopped making Japanese swords, but he still makes knives, and technically this is a knife, even though it feels more swordy. Uh, so if you're interested, you can ping him. I'll try and put some contact stuff in the links below. That's all I have for you. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.